Hi, my name's Ken, and I am a security researcher, um, an ethical hacker, if you like, and we're the good guys. And our job is to go out there and, and break things to make them better. Now, I'm going to be talking today about the Internet of Things, and by that I mean the smart tech in your, your home, so your smart thermostat, your smart door lock, maybe, or perhaps your smart vehicle. But unfortunately, security and the Internet of Things aren't often found in the same place. They're really vulnerable. And we see huge problems with people's personal data, their privacy being invaded, and maybe even their data being locked up and encrypted because IoT manufacturers don't spend enough time looking at security. Now, don't get me wrong, I think IoT, the Internet of Things, has huge benefits to us. I think we can be more beneficial with the use of our resources, with uh, smart thermostats and smart control of our heating. I think medical advances using continuous monitoring with IoT, fantastic. And also assisted living for the elderly, brilliant. IoT can bring all those. But unfortunately, it's not safe until it's secure. Now, my job, what I get to do, I get to break smart things. I love my job because I get to take things apart and break them, make them better. And I don't always have to put them back together again either, which is great. Uh, a project we're doing right now, we're working on a Tesla Model S for our own interest. So we got a hold of a vehicle, very expensive vehicle, 70,000 pounds, and we took it apart. And we found lots of fun things, which I'll publish later on in the year. But then we put it back together, and my colleague said, it's all fine, Ken, you can drive it, it's good. Just watch out for the brakes. <laughs> like, oh, OK. Now, most of the time, organizations bring us stuff so we can break it, we can help them make it better. But sometimes we do work on our own back, so we buy our own technology and start taking it apart to see what we can find. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. I've got lots of examples of some really not quite so smart things. Now, this is the first one I'd like to introduce you. It's actually inside my kettle. Don't worry, we'll see if we can find it. This is a smart fingerprint padlock. Now, I think the idea of a smart padlock is great, because how often do you go around looking for your keys and you can't find them? Well, I lose my keys, I forget my keys, but I don't forget my fingers very often. I usually have those with me. And this is a cool idea. It's a tap lock. It's a fingerprint padlock. The idea, you put your finger on there and it unlocks. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Now, a YouTuber found an issue with this. They discovered that with enough force, you could actually unscrew the back of the lock and open it. So, ooh. And it turned out it was a manufacturing flaw in one lock. There was just one issue with one of them. But we were interested. We wanted to know, are there more problems? So we bought some. And I discovered that it doesn't just open from your finger. You can also use Bluetooth, so you can get hold of your smartphone. And one of my colleagues noticed that he could actually pick up and unlock the lock to order. And here's how he did it. He looked at the mobile app. He took it apart. He reverse engineered it to understand how it worked. And in there, he discovered it needed a key. It needed an electronic key to un unlock this device. But the key to unlock it was the Bluetooth ID of the lock, the Bluetooth MAC address. It's the one thing that is sent out by this lock. It's a bit like leaving the keys to your lock next to it. It's unbelievable. We videoed it here. So with something as simple as a, a phone or a laptop, you could unlock any lock to order. There it goes, it unlocks. We've now got that attack so fast, we can do it in less than 0.8 of a second. That's crazy, right? But then it got worse, because what chance I'm going to find one of these? And another cool researcher, a guy called Vangelis Stikas, looked at the cloud service that the mobile app talked to and realized that you could discover from that where all the locks were. He could pull your address. So now you had the perfect ticket to find out where the locks were and unlock them to order. That's crazy, really crazy. This is an interesting product. It was um, funded, uh, part funded through uh, a TV show called Dragon's Den in Canada, a bit like the Shark Tank in the USA, but um, I think their backers might have some questions now. <laughs> now the next place, your home Wi-Fi, you have a Wi-Fi password, right? Now if I can get hold of that password, if a hacker can get hold of that password, they can get on your Wi-Fi network, and they can start to listen and intercept and redirect the data, so the data you're sending to social networks, maybe the data you're sending to your bank. 
So how could IoT lead to problems like that? Well, I want to introduce one, the very first IoT device I ever looked at, and this is my Wi-Fi kettle. Have anyone got a Wi-Fi kettle? No? You need one. They're great. The idea is you put it in your kitchen. Right. You leave it in your kitchen, then you, you get your cell phone, you, you go to bed, and you wake up in the morning, you press the button on the app, and by the time you get to your kitchen, you've got a kettle full of boiling water. Wow. Saving you 30 seconds of your day? 100 pounds. Now, I looked at this with some of my colleagues and thought, I, I wonder, can that be secure? And I thought I'd show you how we went about hacking it. So the first thing we needed to do was connect to it. And we discovered you could connect to the kettle over Wi-Fi. But it's OK, it's got a password. Now, without the password, I can't go any further. I'm stuck. But I thought, I wonder what we can do. So we took the kettle apart. And in there, we found some chips. And that's the manual for the chips. I thought, I wonder, why don't we have a little look through the manual for the chips for the word password? And there we go. System password is six zeros. Surely hacking is more difficult than this, right? So <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. Wow. Now I'm talking kettle. Excellent. But I still haven't achieved anything. I haven't done anything yet. So I then read further in the manual. We reverse engineered the mobile app, and we discovered a command that scared me. We discovered you could do this. I could recover your Wi-Fi password from your kettle. So now I'm on your home Wi-Fi network. I can listen to everything you're doing. I can redirect your passwords, your data, steal things, everything, just because you wanted to boil your kettle from your bed. <laughs> but it, again, it's, this wasn't the end of it. It still got worse. There's a feature of Wi-Fi. A large number of really cool security researchers have put together a project called War Driving, where they drive around listening to all the Wi-Fi networks out there. And then they map them. And as a result of that, you can go and query their databases and their searches for the addresses of certain Wi-Fi devices. So there are the kettles in the west of London. So I can now know where I have to go to hack someone's house and get their Wi-Fi key. Crazy. Now, in fairness, the manufacturer has now got their security in hand. They're doing a good job. And their latest product, the Kettle 3.0, <laughs> is actually really secure. So they got there in the end. But it was such a shame that they had the security issues along the way. So if you want to boil water remotely, that's the way to do it. Cool. Now, another area I look at, an area that really bothers me, is that around smart toys. Every holiday season, we see more smart technology coming to market. And unfortunately, the security of those toys is often appalling. And this is my favorite IoT device. This is my friend Kayla. <laughs> Hello, Kayla. She's awesome. She's an interactive speaking kids doll. She has a microphone and a speaker. She can speak to your smartphone over Bluetooth, so all the processing goes on over here. And she can listen to what your kids are saying. And she can respond to their questions. She's interactive. She's really cool. Now. How does she work? Well, Kayla is awesome. Microphone, speaker, Bluetooth. She is a hands-free headset. You can make telephone calls on the doll, <laughs> if you wish. You get some very weird looks. And as I'm sure you know, it's, it's illegal to drive with your phone to your ear. <laughs> but not with a doll to your ear, so I understand. So yeah, <laughs> we'll come back to her. But what interested me first was that when I saw her in the store, there were some logos in the box that said, internet safe, child friendly. I thought, well, that's a big claim to make. That's a red rag to me, the ethical hacker. And it also suggested that if you swore at the doll, she would not reply to the child and tell, tell them to go and speak to their parents. And I thought, I wonder. Could I make this thing swear? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> now, the bit that I found creepy was when you connect your smartphone to your vehicle, you have to put in a pin, right? And that sets up a type of frequency hopping, which gives you security. However, when you connect your phone to the doll, there is no pin, which means that anyone in Bluetooth range, so 30, 40, 50 meters, can connect to the child's doll. Microphone, speaker which means that someone outside on the street or in the next house can listen to the microphone and spy on your kids, 
or can talk to them as well. And I find that really, really creepy. Now, in terms of swearing, we had some fun. We, we looked to see how she swore. Don't worry, I'm not going to embarrass you. And we discovered a database in the mobile app of 1,536 really good swear words. <laughs> so we deleted them. And now she swears like a docker. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just really creepy. We'll come back to Kayla in a bit. The next pod I want to go to is around home video. Now, this is a wireless home security camera. It's really cool. It's battery operated, and it has a really good battery life, and you can stick it in your house, or you can stick it in um, outside your home, and you can see your house and your security cameras remotely from your phone. And unfortunately, we found some security flaws with it, that when you access the cloud service that the mobile, the mobile phone talks to and interacts with the, uh, the cameras, unfortunately, you can switch it to someone else's cameras just by messing around with the camera IDs, and you can see someone else's footage. It's got a microphone, too, so you can listen as well. Now, the good news about this one is it got fixed very quickly. The manufacturer was really responsive, and they fixed it really fast, which is great. But this product's been on the market for about nine months, and it was only us coming along that resulted in the vulnerability being found, and I think that's really worrying. Now, that's a wireless camera. This one is slightly different. This is a wired security camera. It takes power, and it sends its feed, not over Wi-Fi, but over um, a, a cable. And it goes to a recorder called a digital video recorder. And these are many and many of these around the world, in offices, in homes. And a computer hacker found a vulnerability in the recorders. And he realized that he could connect to them all and make them all start attacking other websites. Nearly 300,000. IoT digital video recorders started attacking various social networks in October 2016. They took it offline. They took Twitter offline for two hours. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> Crazy. So we have weapons from the IoT in our house. Now, maybe you've been unlucky. Maybe you've had data held to ransom. Maybe your photographs, your family photographs, have been encrypted by bad guys and held to ransom. Now, we wanted to explore whether it was possible to hold IoT to ransom. And we started off by looking at a smart thermostat. This is a, a brand that's quite popular over, over in the US. And we started looking at its security to understand how it worked. And the first thing we did is we got the code out of the chips. It's called firmware. And we analyzed that to see if there are any security flaws in there. But along the way, we found some crazy stuff. One of the routines that deals with making an encrypted SSL connection, so HTTPS, the padlock, the developer called the, um, the routine this, the unhandled SSL bleep status. This is production product. It also has the facility for you to upload family photographs to act as a, a wallpaper, so you can have photos of your family and kids on the thermostat. And the process that deals with that was called son of a bitch mode. <laughs> wow. This is production product out there in people's homes. And that's how weird the code was. We found a bunch of security flaws. Unsurprisingly, this code was so oddly put together with so many weird references. And we discovered we could actually hold someone's thermostat, their heating and their air conditioning, to ransom. Now, that was a bit silly. So why, why would you encrypt someone's thermostat? Fine, but what if that was your vehicle? And your vehicle wouldn't start unless you paid a ransom. This is all very possible. And that's what really worries me about the state of IoT right now. It's really quite concerning. But then I realized the same attack could do something really nasty. The problem with IoT, it's not your IoT. It's everyone's IoT has all got the same problem. So every instance of that thermostat could be used by a hacker. What if they could trigger everyone's heating or air cooling at the same time? You can create spikes on the power grid. And it doesn't take very much to trip a power cut. So our desire to put smart technology in our houses has inadvertently exposed the stability of our nations. I think that's really worrying. There is some good news, not very much. There's been some good efforts to try and get vulnerable, poor, insecure IoT banned. And some work by the Norwegian Consumers Council and also the European Consumer Organization resulted in my friend Kayla being withdrawn from sale in numerous European countries. A German privacy lawyer successfully got Kayla banned in Germany for breaking a couple of laws, which is why I had to fly here via Zurich, not Munich. 
<laughs> so she's been withdrawn from sale from numerous places. Unfortunately, progress by governments is slow. On the left, there was a really good bill put forward in the US Senate. It's still in committee stage. I haven't heard anything more about it in the past year. But it's a start. It's about trying to regulate certain standards for the US government buying smart technology. And I'm really sad to say that the EU was making great progress with this. But um, just last week, I believe, their new standards for IT security have now been agreed to be voluntary for consumer IT. And I think that's a real shame. And I think we can do better than that. What about you, though? What about us? What can we do? How can we improve things? Well, there are some things that we can all do. And the first thing I want you all to do is go and actually fix yourselves. You don't need to be a cool hacker to hack people. If your passwords are weak, easy to guess, or blank, or the default one, make them long and strong. Use a password manager. Make sure the pins on your mobile phones aren't four digits. Make sure they're six or eight. And then patches. Apply patches to your phones and your computers to make them stay secure. And the next thing. IoT, you can put it on a separate network at home. If you don't know how to do that, go and read up. If you don't want to do that, don't buy IoT. Just be safe. <laughs> but I think also as consumers, we can make a difference too. If we don't buy product that we're not sure about the security of, we're going to force the hands of manufacturers to actually prove it's secure and make it safe for us. The problem is this. There are far too many IoT products out there. There aren't enough organizations and people like me out there doing research and exposing this poor practice, and there are very few IoT vendors that actually care about security. There are some good examples, but by and large, IoT security is really poor. And sadly, I think we have to face it, is there is a serious problem with security in IoT. To the point, I think we almost need to be afraid of IoT. Thank you. <laughs>